Bruce, I, I'm a little biased, but I thought that was the best panel of the day. <laughs> so, so we actually are on our last panel of the day. Um, and I want to invite the, the speakers and moderator to come up. So really what we've been trying to do today, and hopefully successfully, is lay out an argument and a case and uh, analysis for why we've got to put innovation at the center of our environment and energy challenges in the U.S. and in the world. And one of the problems I think we've had is you, you certainly have people who are just not even going to join this debate. They're, they're climate skeptics. They don't think it's real. They may think it's real, but they don't think there's any role for government. Okay, those folks probably aren't going to be changed by anything we say or do. But there's a much broader group of folks who are engaged in this debate, but until now have not been able to really find common ground. Uh, and mostly the, the, common, the debate is between, historically between environmentalists who have tended to say, let's just do cap and trade, let's just do the renewable energy standards, let's just do efficiency standards and that's going to get us where we go. And then other folks who are more about technology and innovation. And so the real question I think is, is there this new common ground that we might be able to find? And I'm actually quite encouraged about this because um, I think as we heard, uh, as we heard this morning from, from, uh, from, from Letha from World Resource Institute, you know, they just, if you haven't seen their report, it is a very, very good report from an environmental organization talking about how critical clean energy innovation is. Um, and uh, NRDC has been doing great work on this as well. They've been doing great analytical work. So I think there's this perhaps this new moment, if you will, where we can talk about forging a, a united front, perhaps, and, and moving, this, moving this ball forward. So um, I want to introduce our, our moderator here, uh, Monica Trezzi, who is the managing editor and host of ETV. And uh, e and ETV, excuse me, which is a division of E&E Publishing. She serves as the moderator of e &E's daily TV daily interview program On Point, and she's conducted hundreds of interviews with newsmakers on energy and environmental issues. So, Monica, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, we've decided to do something a little different with this panel, and we're going to skip the opening remarks and just head right into a discussion. We have a short amount of time, and I think our two panelists um, are excited to jump into a discussion. So to my right, we have David Goldston. He's the Director of Government, Government Relations at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And David's former life was on the Hill, uh, heading up the House Committee on Science and as a Legislative Director for Congressman Bullard. And Josh Freed is the Vice President for Clean Energy at Third Way. Prior to joining Third Way, Josh served for more than a decade as a political strategist for national, federal, and local campaigns, and was, was a senior staffer also on Capitol. So, to open things up, I'll just throw it out to both of you. Um, clean energy innovation is under attack in many circles in Washington and around the So where do you, each of you stand? Is there a united front? Can there be a united front? Yeah, and I think there, there already is in the reporters as well. And I'm not sure how new that is, but um, but it's certainly true now. Uh, so uh, certainly, clean energy can be under is under attack. I guess even as we speak, <laughs> um, in terms of the last reports. But uh, but I think there is a broad range of groups and that can agree on some fundamental uh, premises that include the fact that we need uh, innovation policy, that we need funding of R&D, we need to figure out ways to get through the, the so-called valley of death, uh, you know, frightening precise term, but it definitely refers to something um, or some things. And, um, and that, you know, we, may, we need policy tools as well, but that you can't have one or the other. You really need to deal with both the demand side and the supply side, and there's a lot of room for agreement, especially on that supply side piece of it, supplying new ideas, that is, um, that's been the focus of a lot of the conference today. Yeah, and if you want to understand why, and one of the reasons why the general public is so disgusted with Washington, um, or at least the folks on Capitol Hill, I mean, this, this is an issue, it's the perfect example. Uh, we're in the midst of focus groups with uh, swing voters in working class Ohio and North Carolina and several other states, and we're looking primarily at clean energy innovation. Do people understand it? Do they support it? And what are they willing to support? And 
they are just bewildered that there's even a debate in Washington on this. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised to hear that even where folks understood about Solyndra, the average voter says, well, yeah, you're going to lose some money on some things, but that's never stopped companies before. Let's, let's keep going. Uh, and I think you have had for a while and increasingly uh, support across the environmental and, and innovation communities or uh, broader clean energy communities on this. Uh, the challenge is it's become increasingly a partisan political issue amongst some factions in Washington and just like almost every other uh, issue where you need something to move here in DC, uh, it's getting frozen out. So you guys are supposed to be polar opposites on this panel. It doesn't seem <laughs> right, that way. Right. Um, and it does seem like you're kind of bridging the gap. So what's the issue then? Why? What is the problem between the pro-environmentalism movement and the pro-innovation movement? I don't, th I mean, at least for the two of us, I don't think there is one. I mean, you could probably, you know, grab some people off the streets and have a fight, I guess. But the, um, <laughs> but um, I think, again, I mean, there may be differences on emphasis. There may be things where if you're covering the entire range of tools that people want to look at or geez, you can have differences. But I think the more notable thing is the broad area of agreement. And again, especially on the need for innovation policy. And I think, you know, that's important for the environmental movement because you need to be able to present a uh, vision of what you want the future to look like and what you want to be for. And it can't just be about every, you know, every solution has a problem, which they all do, but that can't be, you can't be left with a null set. And so I think we need to work together with as many different kinds of groups as possible to come up with how you can move um, forward toward, a, you know, a cleaner uh, future that will also hopefully help the U.S. in a range of other ways, including, you know, national security and otherwise. I mean, and, and let's face it, there's also, we're in a diff very different era on energy and, uh, I'll dare say the word rather than David, climate change issues than we were even two years ago. And whereas, uh, cap and trade was the dominant paradigm to discuss in terms of policy and there were a lot of differences when you lifted uh, looked under the hood on how to accomplish that where money should go what the policy goal should be uh, at least for the foreseeable future that issue cap and trade or another very large uh, economy-wide or even sector-wide policy issue isn't uh, isn't moving in Washington and so everyone's looking for other areas where we can find agreement where we can f look for victories and move forward on that and I think it's created it has created a real opportunity for environmental and innovation and other advocates uh, to seek common ground and uh, speak in a more unified voice than they may have in the past and I think you know one of the barriers um, to getting movement on a comprehensive cap and trade bill was the sense the public had that, you know, are we really ready? Do we really know how to move into this other kind of economy? Yes, we'd like to, as these focus groups apparently indicate, but, um, but are we there yet? And so the more things we can do now to start moving that direction, show there are more technologies available and so forth, um, the better off we are to getting those larger policy tools, which in the end are absolutely essential, whether it's cap and trade or some other form, are essential to getting changes which are largely necessary for societal reasons. The reason we want to change the um, nature of the energy economy is not because you know our cars aren't getting anywhere now, it's that they're getting somewhere while causing too many other uh, you know, externalities to many other problems, whether it's pollution or policy or whatever. So, um, so I think these things actually can add to each other; they're not in conflict with each other. Do either are either of you concerned that um, a possible clean energy debate could end in the same way that the cap and trade debate did? Um, yeah. Can I just ask you to maybe just take your cell phone off? That's why we're getting some feedback here. I can just put it over the chair. <laughs> Both myself. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thanks. If you could keep them, I'd be even happier, actually. Um, you mean, could we predict possible failure and stalemate in Washington? I suppose we could. Um, the, um, I think, you know, that's the danger. I think the, 
Look, the, some aspects of this debate on energy have been going on for a very long time, and arguably they're, you know, Hamilton versus Jefferson. Um, you'd think we'd have gotten at least good about how we argue about them over that long, which we seem to not quite do. But, um, but I think in the end, you know, there's, there's pressure that everyone feels about moving forward. And it's interesting that there are elements of um, the energy debate that you would think would have been more controversial that haven't been. So um, RPE, for example, which was very controversial at its outset, I actually had, to, and my boss at the time, Mr. Bullitt, had some issues with it, more not philosophical issues, issues about where, whether it work. I think the way it's been put into place, it is. But you would think that would be like a huge target for a Republican attack. And I hope by saying that I don't sort of make it so. But And it hasn't been. I mean, Rob didn't think, oh my God, the person we can't really have to start this off as a rune. I mean, instead, he's sort of the local hero. So that's a sign that there is some willingness to do different things, to move things that are, you know, at least, R I mean, RP is not basic research. It's not supposed to be anyway. So to at least move into that direction. Things like CETA, at least in the sen Senate, you know, don't divide easily along partisan lines. So. Um, I don't think this is going to be clear sailing. Nothing, you know, is these days. I mean, you know, it's hard to even see the sea. But the, um, but I don't think it has to end in the kind of um, that it has to end the way climate has so far. Partly because climate has problems. Partly because it's a become a proxy cultural war, and the energy stuff doesn't fit as easily into that. Um, and I think one reason that I think Josh and I are anxious to eager to have our groups and others work together is because it helps prevent it from devolving into a culture war and and i think i mean you look even at the hearings today with secretary chu as frustrating as they were in many accounts you had brian bilbray congressman from california relatively conservative on many issues who uh asked very good questions about both the current loan program but also clearly is supportive of moving the country writ large to clean energy technologies. Uh, in the Senate, you do have uh, Senator Alexander, who's supportive of a number of technologies, uh, and a number of other, uh, unfortunately still too small a handful, but a number of Republicans uh, who are serious and interested in figuring out how we can move the United States to a cleaner future. Uh, the the there are a number of questions, David alluded to many of them, I and mean, you also have, keep in mind, the super committee and the challenge of, you know, how many resources does the federal government have to take on any issue, not just this year and next, but for several years into the future. And it does limit when you're talking about either uh, the need for investments in R&D or the need for incentives for deployment over X period of years, uh, what our policy options are. And so uh, one of the questions may not whether there should be one. And you know, hopefully at some point the question is turned around so that in terms of who it's supposed to, where instead of those basically who believe in a government role having to lay out how it's always been there, as Josh and I just did. The question would be, where's your, how, explain how this is going to happen, how this has ever happened um, without a government role. Um, and that, that should really be the question. And that, then followed by, then you do indeed have to define it there can be legitimate differences, and it can't be entirely government, but no one's really arguing well, and, for that. And the one, the one point that I think uh, we've missed a little bit, or at least I've missed a little bit here, that has not been amplified as much as it should be in the media or the national debate is, that's what you're hearing from many of the utilities and many of the companies that are actually engaged in this and, and you know, they have obligations to their shareholders to generate profits, they have obligations to their ratepayers. Uh, they, they want government involvement. I mean, you know, you look at uh, whether it's the early stage companies uh, that are looking to develop the new technologies and then get through the valleys of death to companies uh, such as NRG that are in the midst of so deploying solar. Uh, you're, you're hearing, in fact, even from some of the traditional utilities, to, to, you know, sometimes to my surprise, uh, <clears throat> like the CEO of AEP, defending a government role in regulation. Um, we need to hear and see more of that from the business sector to counteract the, uh, the unfortunately dominant theme that regulation is simply bad and is retarding economic growth. And we need to hear 
more from the business community to step up and say, hey, the government needs to provide us certainty. They need to be continued to be involved in innovation and take the calculated risks that are good for the country uh, because it benefits the business community as much, if not more, than it benefits many of the rest of us. Uh, and, and that voice, while present, has not been either uh, acknowledged as much as it should be, nor maybe is it there as much as it should be yet. Okay, we're going to wrap it right on that note. Thanks. Thank you both. Thank, thank you, Monica. That was great. Let me just close uh, with two minutes. Um, make a couple of comments. Somebody asked a question, what can you all do? Um, clearly, you can blog about this. You can tweet about this. You can pass the message along. You can go to the great uh, colleagues and partners that we work with and look at their work and try to get that out to elected officials, the media, and others. Uh, I think another key thing we can all do is develop a, basically unify around a common message, a common direction, which is really what this panel is about. And, and I 100% agree with David, you know, Washington is about ideology, it is about messages, and, and one thing I've learned in the last few years is, is you know, which is really hard for me because I get bored so quickly. Um, but saying the same thing over and over and over again is really, really powerful, uh, if, especially if it's a good thing. Uh, and uh, I think all of us who search for... Yeah, exactly. So it's just hard sometimes. Uh, and I think that that's a, that's a key part. So I actually have a, a mnemonic or a thing I, I think we can all get around. And I, I, we're really good at kind of coming up with these things. Almost as good as third way. So I, mine is, um, here's, the, here's the motto, driving down new learning curves now. That was a joke, just so you know that. That was a joke. Everybody. <laughs> Nobody got that. It's the end of the day. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm not going to try any more jokes. So uh, I also, I've, I want to close. I want to thank our, our partners. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, in particular uh, um, Nathan Cummings Foundation, the Lotus Foundation. Really, really great. We couldn't do that without them. And, and lastly, I want to thank uh, ITIF staff who you know, put in really countless hours to make this happen. Matt Stepp and Matt Horahan who organized this. Uh, Kath Gurgley and Andrea Matus, uh, Catherine Angstadt, Alexis Farron, and Steve Norton. They really worked very, very hard to pull this off. And uh, finally, I want to thank all of you for coming and sticking around. And I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, we'll hopefully we'll see you. Uh, hopefully there'll be an Energy Innovation 2012. And next year when we debate, uh, we have these, we'll say, man, we actually did pretty good in the last 12 months. We're in better shape than we thought we were going to be. So thank you all and have a great day. Thank you.